From Flourish DX, this is the Psych Health and Safety Podcast. With workplace mental health becoming a safety prerogative, this is the source of information on psychological injury prevention and health promotion. Hi, and welcome to the Psych Health and Safety Podcast. My name is Jason Ben Shee, and I'm one of the hosts of the show. The aim of the podcast is to rapidly increase the knowledge and application of psychological health and safety in workplaces worldwide. To help with this, we're regular guests from around the world who are leading the way in this important area. But before I introduce our guest and topic for today, allow me to introduce my co-host, Joel Mitchell. How are you, Joel? I went to the annual um, athletics carnival yesterday for my son's school and I did not get sunburnt. Yeah, so that's an accomplishment. Yes, because it is. last last year you got burnt, wasn't it? I got burnt on the backs of my hands last year. Yeah, yeah. We'll actually have to find the corresponding podcast episode from last year and um, yeah, recount that story of the sunburn. If you so want to, if you want to allocate that time to somebody to do that, Jason, you can. Yeah, we'll get Jack to look it up. And then I'm he, sure and that's an excellent. He can turn it into a meme because he loves you know spending his time <laughs> on memes. <laughs> he does. I'm sure that Brendan won't mind at all. Um, yeah, using Jack's time like that. Yeah, absolutely. Just, just for the sake of an internal meme. I will put it on LinkedIn. Oh, we'll it'll share be, it yeah, everywhere. Yeah, with yeah. my um my my progress. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So, did you put sunscreen on the back of your hands? This I time? did twice. Twice in the yeah. morning and after the lunch break. Yeah, because your UV is not that high, but you are. Um, we're talking about it today. You, you're not a ginger, but you come from a family where there is strong ginger lineage. There is. There are gingers in my family, yeah. Yeah. You have yeah. the skin of a ginger, not the hair I of a do, ginger. I do. I do, yeah. Um, I've got, um, yeah, I, I don't I don't uh, really tan. I just burn and then I peel and then I'm white again. Yeah. Which is a great incentive for me to um, maintain good skin health. There you go. Top tip, a, top tip, listeners. Yeah, if you if you want to avoid skin cancer, listeners, just have skin that burns really easily. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if only, um, yeah, it wasn't just genetic, right? Like, yeah. Well, some of it's genetic, some of it's environmental. Yeah. Um, cool. Uh, any other news? Um, Did uh, they haven't introduced parkour into uh, athletics kind of yet? Believe it or not, no, they haven't. Shockingly, oh, they should have Ninja Warrior courses. Ronan would love that. They sh- I mean, I'm sure that the kids would probably enjoy yeah. it more. The parents would definitely enjoy it more. Yeah, it's a pretty boring day in athletics carnival. Like, yeah, there's you know, they they all do the run, the hundred meters or whatever it is, and then like they do the team events, and basically each kid does like one of the different team events. Mm. So there's just lots of sitting around wondering what the hell's going on. Um, and then after that, the senior and the junior schools like swap sides of the oval and then it's the tabloids, which is even worse because they're all just standing in a line and then they get to the front of the line and they have to like throw the ball and try to get it into the basket. Yeah. Um, they call it tabloids. Tabloids, yeah. Okay. And it's just interminable. Like yeah. and it's in, it's in the afternoon, so the sun's sort of starting to get hot, yeah. and you're just literally just sitting there waiting for your kid to get to the front of the queue, so that they can see that you've watched them throw the ball, <laughs> and then give them a thumbs up, and then you have to wait another fifteen minutes before it's their turn again. Yeah. Ugh. Well, well uh, get this. So, um, you know, the sport gene runs strong in my family, right? It does. It's yeah. More from my wife's side than, than my side. I'll admit it. Um, but I went to my kids' um, school assembly today, mm-hmm. and both of my daughters got trophies. One for the swimming, uh, what was it, swimming champion for the girls, and then the other one had won the cross country. Mm-hmm. Anyway, they had the inter school cross country today. Uh, one of my girls came twenty seventh, and she was quite happy with that. She came third deliberately uh, for cross country just so she could get the day off school. Yeah. Uh, today, so she didn't really care how she went. My other one, who won, nice. I if like you it. recall, by 400 metres in a 1,500-metre race. I do recall. You might have mentioned it once or twice. And I might have, if sports bet were offering odds, I would have probably taken a bet mm. um, on this one, but she did win the inter school as well. So Impressive. smashed it in. She's a, Impressive. She definitely takes after my wife. My son came dead last in the race, um, continuing his grand tradition of coming last in, in the running races. Yeah. Um, every year so far, so we're on a roll. Yep, that's okay. Like, um, you know, it's okay not to be a good runner. And it is. I, I think both of you and I probably wouldn't say that we're great runners. So. Well, I just don't run at all, um, unless uh, under duress. Yeah. But he did, um, his team did win the 
pass ball or whatever it's called. Captain ball or something like that. It's where they all like stand in a row and they sort of throw like the ball zigzag up the row. Okay, I think they're making up stuff now. Just no, I remember to... doing that in primary school. And I remember like we had we had to be coached in like how to step, like start to step back before you catch the ball and then you start you step forward as soon as you've caught the ball to like maximise the speed of passing along the line. Cool. Mm. It's funny the things that you remember from your childhood. Yeah. Um, but look, I think we've been going for a while. I think we really we should have. We've been rabbiting on. This yeah, is sorry, just, um, sorry, ridiculous. listeners. We've already determined our listeners don't tune in for us. They, tune they in don't. For our guests. Yeah, look, we we'll just like see how long we can um, drag it on for. We could probably keep going like this for an hour, and it would be perfect, right, for after dark. We could easily talk crap for an hour. Listeners, Jason's going to keep on going about this until you start harassing Dan. Yeah, we'll see. Anyway, <laughs> I don't let's, think we will. Yeah, we'll, maybe we need simpler email addresses and then people will be able to get through. I don't know. I'm sure that's the, the only problem. And we're getting um, faster internet connection as well. Maybe that's been the issue too. That could yeah. be the issue, the lack of fibre. Mm. Yeah. All right, so look, let's introduce our guest. Yep. Uh, with 30 years in senior leadership roles in law firms and a lived experience of burnout, he has a passion for creating a sense of safety, inclusion and belonging in the workplace. He is the founder of Whole Business Wellness, Welcome to the podcast, Brian Henderson. Hey, Jason. Hi, Joel. Lovely to be on the show. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, and great to have you on, mate. Um, now, you're based in Hong Kong, aren't you, Brian? Yep. Yep. Enjoying. We just had a typhoon up here, so uh, it's been interesting times in Hong Kong. Yeah, so you're in Northern Hemisphere, right? So it's your, your summer and our, our winter. Yep. Oh, yeah, it's steamy. Yeah, I was up in Singapore a month ago and um, I forgot that it's just north of the equator. So uh, I, I didn't. I expected it to be warmer, but not like really, really hot and humid. So that was a shock. I feel like that's just always Singapore, though. Yeah, well, that's right. It's kind of like Bali, right? It's always humid. Mm. Um, But I didn't expect it to be their summer and humid. I thought it would be winter and humid. Yeah. It's a sneaky one. I think it's only about 50 metres northern hemisphere. Yeah, there's not much difference, I don't think. Yeah. It was warm. (laughs) Hot and steamy all year round in Singapore. (laughs) And same time, daybreak and dusk every day, same time. No seasons. Yeah, it must be strange just to to live without seasons. Mm. How do you know what time of year it is? Calendars. Well, that, I mean, that's what. Yeah, what would you do without a calendar? Uh, just, just live. <laughs> 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 oh dear, <laughs> Brian. Um, you're not a big uh, a listener of, of content, but what are some uh, books or articles that you've been enjoying lately? Yeah, um, yeah, I do enjoy my reading. I find that's just a nice way to relax. And you know, part of what I try to teach people is to find a way to disconnect from you know, social media or devices, any of whatever sort. Um, so I find reading is actually quite, quite a nice way to do that. Um, the sort of things I've been reading in the last month or two, um, Brene Brown, I read Dare to Lead and Atlas of the Heart. Just fantastic. Um, so many great insights. Uh, and then Amy Edmondson, you can catch her on uh, YouTube, I will admit to, <laughs> occasionally. And uh, she also does a podcast, which I listen to occasionally. So they're both very much into emotional intelligence. Uh, Amy Edmondson is a, a professor and academic, and she researches psychological safety. Um, so very much at the heart of what I do. So when I'm reading their work, I'm actually figuring out how can I apply this in my own uh, training and, and coaching. Another great book that I would strongly recommend is by Catherine Mannix with a K and a Y. Uh, and she wrote a book called Listen. Uh, Catherine is actually an end of life doctor, so um, palliative care. So she has a lot of conversations with patients who are you know, in the process of, of dying, sadly, and of course with families who are struggling to process all of that. Um, and her book is absolutely wonderful. It's a combination of just stories of the way those conversations have gone and the sort of circumstances around them. Um, and then a little bit of a framework around how can you help somebody to tell their own story so they can make sense of what's happening in those very, very difficult circumstances. So it's, it's an absolutely beautiful read. Uh, then more broadly, uh, I'm also into the diversity and inclusion space. Um, so I read Mindful of Race by Ruth King. Uh, and that's really looking inside ourselves to see what 
are we believing about race and racial difference? And how's that get in, getting in the way of our ability to connect with people who are different from us um, and to take action um, around racial uh, discrimination, differences, biases, which of course we all have. Another one which I love, which is kind of in the space, Compassionomics uh, by Stephen Kristiak and Anthony Maxarelli, all the research around how compassion both helps the person who is being compassion. So compassion is about not just empathy, but actually taking action off the back of that to relieve whatever suffering uh, of the person you're, you're showing compassion towards. So very, very beneficial for the medical professionals in this case. Um, also, of course, very beneficial for the patients um, as well. And in terms of business, quality of service, satisfaction, so much evidence behind the importance of compassion in, in any interaction, but particularly in the workplace. Uh, another one which I enjoyed um, was Lost Connections by Johan Harry. Uh, and his whole thesis is about the fact that we have you know, lost connection with purposeful work, lost connection in the social context, lost connection with our, our bodies and our inner world, lost connection with the planet. Um, and you know how important it is to kind of find those connections again um, to really support our, our mental health and well-being. So uh, I love the messages in his book. Um, so those are those are the kind of books that I've been reading. I do read some sort of fairly geeky technical research papers um, on kind of mindfulness and compassion in the workplace. Uh, there was one some great work by a lady called Sigal Barsaid, who sadly passed away just earlier this year, on what she calls companionate love. So your love for your companions that you work with every day. Um, and how that gets expressed and how that also creates an environment in which people can really thrive at work and support each other. So those are, so I kind of, you know, for fun, for me, reading all that stuff is, is kind of for fun as well as for work. I just, I just really enjoy it. It does help me make that little gap between my busy day online and then my, my private time and my quieter time in the evening. Well, that's a great list of, of resources for our listeners to have a look at. Thank you for that. Uh, can you... Tell us about your professional career, please. Sure. So I became a lawyer by accident uh, in the sense that I didn't really know what else to do. I, didn't, I wasn't drawn towards any other kind of job or career. Um, so I, I became a lawyer kind of by accident. Uh, it was in the family. It seemed like a sensible thing. It seemed useful to get a professional qualification. Um, and I did enjoy it for a while, but I realized that actually I was not sufficiently passionate about it to be really successful at a very top firm. Uh, so I decided I needed to take a break, step away, and I thought I would be interested in uh, management. So I could see that law firms were getting bigger, getting more complex, getting more professionally managed, but still like really weak on the whole people skills. Lawyers are very um, rational, analytical, kind of technical mindset. Um, and some of them can be very empathetic, but that's not kind of typically what springs to mind when you think about a lawyer. So I felt I could learn more about that. So I took an MBA, which focused on all of that kind of personal development uh, side. Uh, I was a stay-at-home dad, actually, while I was doing that. Uh, our kids were born um, just after I started my MBA program. And my, our second, was just, our son was born just as I was doing my final exam. So it was lovely to be able to spend some time you know, with the kids when they were so young and support my wife who went back to work during that time. And then I moved back into law firms, various management roles, global roles uh, of various different types, chief operating officer, practice management, corporate social responsibility, uh, coaching and development, faculty. So really interesting times. Uh, I spent about 13 years at a firm called Linklaters. Um, and then I felt it was time after the global financial crisis. There was a couple of things. One was that the economy in Europe was just clearly only going in one direction, which was downhill fast. And sadly, that has not changed <laughs> since 2008. Um, but also, I was finding I was doing some of the work that I had been doing maybe many years earlier in my career. So I felt time to go to Asia, where the market is more dynamic, there's more things going on. Actually, it's quite an important competitive uh, theatre for big law firms. Um, so I joined a firm called Baker & McKenzie out here in Hong Kong. Uh, that was 10 years ago. Um, during that time, I also got involved with a charity here called the Women's Foundation, uh, which supports women and girls in Hong Kong. 
um, and I worked with them to develop a male ally program. Uh, so we've got now, I think we're up to our fifth cohort uh, of men who are going through this program, learning how to be an ally. What does it take? What's helpful? What are some of the issues that women face that perhaps men just don't focus on, maybe not even aware of? So that's been tremendously rewarding. And then a couple of years ago, I, as you mentioned, I had my burnout experience. Um, I was diagnosed with depression and anxiety. I had really chronic insomnia. I was getting maybe two and a half hours sleep, maybe three hours if I was lucky. Uh, so just a bit of a mess. So I decided to step away from that. And as I reflected on that experience, I, I realized that it was kind of weird that I didn't see it coming in, in the personal sense. I was just ignoring the signs, um, not really paying attention, not listening to my body, just surviving, frankly, certainly not thriving. Um, and I also got to reflect on, you know, what else is it that companies and organizations can do to support employees? Because I feel it's a shared responsibility. It's not just down to the individual, um, but it's also down to the employer to you know, support and provide an environment where people can talk about their mental health and get the support they need and have whatever accommodations and adjustments they may need to you know, get themselves back on their feet. So when I reflect back on all of that, I guess it's, you know, it's always been something to do with, you know, humanity and uh, in the workplace, uh, making the workplace experience better for everybody, trying to create workplaces where people can really thrive as opposed to just survive. And so that experience of burnout um, led you to your current role? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. So yes, yeah, so I created I created my own business called Whole Business Wellness, uh, as Jason mentioned. Um, and there's basically three work streams that we are involved in. The first is awareness raising. Uh, so here in Hong Kong, um, we're still in that phase. Uh, maybe in Australia and Europe and US, maybe people are moving beyond that now. But I like to work with people who have lived experience, who can talk about what it's like having a panic attack or what it's like living with major depression or maybe bipolar or similar. Um, so I find that really helps to make it resonate. So if you show people pictures of saber-toothed tigers and amygdalas, you know, it's kind of interesting, but it's a little in one ear and out the other. So I, I like to work with people who can actually tell what it's like to live with some of these mental health conditions and how they manage it and what do they find helpful and what do they find just annoying or frustrating when people you know, interact with them. Second part we do is all around a resilience building and we use a psychometric assessment. So that's answering my first question, which is how do you know where you are on that burnout scale? So <laughs> that's what our psychometric does, which I, uh, I work with a woman called Rachel Alston on who, who developed this after her own burnout experience. Um, so that gives you a score out of 100, tells you exactly where you are on the burnout scale, uh, and it breaks it down into five different aspects um, of how your stress affects you. Uh, and then where for me it gets really exciting is we can aggregate that to a team level, so you can sit with the team and say, okay, this is how your stress is showing up. Um, let's have a conversation about that, and the first thing that most people say is, oh, I thought it was just me, but it seems like we're all kind of experiencing something the same. <laughs> So a couple of things on that one is, yes, you are you know, in the same environment, doing the same sort of work, experiencing the same sort of pressures. So funnily enough, it does show up sort of similar ways to, you know, for most people. And of course, the second thing is we're all very good at putting our game face on and pretending like we're okay and um, hiding our struggles. So, you know, it really opens up the conversation and allows the team to have that conversation in a safe space. And it actually, it gives them shared collective ownership of whatever their issues are. So what can we as a team do differently? Maybe it's less meetings, making sure they're not back to back, giving us meeting free days. Maybe it's just we need more social interaction, non-work related, just to get to know each other and support each other better. Or maybe it's something about the environment of the workplace. We just need more green space or more light or whatever. Um, so teams are always very creative at coming up with you know, an action plan. And off the back of that sort of analysis and planning comes some capability and culture building. So my clients will often realize that it's important to talk about your stresses and how you're dealing with them, but that conversation is not an easy one. So people want a bit of guidance and help. How can I have that conversation? What, what are the skills? How can we practice that? And some people then realize that 
if they don't have a basic level of psychological safety, you know, however much you practice the conversations, they probably still won't happen because people are just concerned about the consequences. So we get into psychological safety. And when I ask leaders and managers in particular to reflect on how well they are managing their own emotions and how their emotional regulation impacts their team, they can very quickly see that they need to be much more mindful of their own state and how that uh, does affect their team um, because if they're being like I was when I was struggling, if I'm being grumpy, you know, a bit rude and a bit offhand, a bit short with people, um, you know, that has a very corrosive effect on the on the corporate culture. So we get into that sort of mindful leadership um, and also diversity, inclusion, belonging. So without a sense of belonging, you're always going to feel somehow defensive. You can feel there's some sort of threat here um, because I don't feel safe. Um, so we do a lot of work around how do you create a space where people can feel like they can belong, they can bring how much of themselves they feel they want to bring to the workplace. Uh, I'm not a believer in bringing your whole self to the workplace because <laughs> there's probably parts of ourselves you really don't want to bring. Uh, but whichever bits you do want to bring that are helpful in the workplace, you know, how do you create that environment? Um, and that really underpins the mental health um, and everything that goes with that that allows people to thrive if you can create that platform. So that's it. So awareness raising, resilience and action planning, and then capability and culture building. Yeah, so that's an interesting process because you're actually starting with the individual health model and then you're actually taking the, them through that process of going beyond that and actually looking at, well, there are team dynamics here that in influence that and there's also organizational level dynamics that influence that so you are actually helping them to um, progress along that um, that sort of maturity um, of, of thinking about mental health exactly I think in our culture in our certainly in our Western culture maybe even in the Asian culture as well is this kind of assumption that mental health is an individual thing um, but actually it's a social thing um, there's a lot of research that shows that mental health issues, um, they arise in a social context. So left to our own devices, most people will broadly speaking be content, um, but it's what happens in the social environment that causes us to be unhappy and causes us to struggle with our mental health. So, you know, again, that's one of my core messages is that mental health is a team sport. Um, you know, it's not down to the individual to fix themselves. The individual was probably fine until something happened or several things happened in their workplace or in their private life or both. Um, and it does take a it takes a village if you like to to help bring that um, back to to balance. Um, so yeah, there's probably a lot of you know indigenous knowledge and wisdom around that as well, which you're probably familiar with too. So yeah, mm. yeah, it's um yeah, it's interesting as Joelle pointed out. You know how you're looking at the individual and then looking at the team and organisational kind of um, psychosocial factors, I guess that influence mental health as well. Um, definitely what, you know, we ascribe to as well, that shared responsibility. Um, what we're trying to do on the podcast, though, obviously, is highlight the bit that's been missing for a while and the employers and, and leaders going, well, actually, we have a part to play in this beyond just pointing people to assistance when we've broken them um, and going upstream, preventing that from happening, right? But um, I'm interested to hear your perspective because, obviously, you started in the law uh, and then got into management and now you're very much in the mental health industry. So how do you find working in the mental health industry in, in Hong Kong? Well, Hong Kong was, you know, the most stressed and the most longest hours city on the planet, even before we had our social unrest um, and our COVID and our crazy you know, policy response to our COVID outbreaks. Um, so it, it has been interesting being here. I think there's no doubt there is a huge level of stress here. So I think Vitality found that the average number of presenteeism days, i.e. days where people are in the office but just not really able to focus on doing their work, is about 35 working days per person per year. One of our other local NGOs here, City Mental Health Alliance, did a study on that uh, last year and they found in Hong Kong it's more like 50 days, five zero. So it's huge. So there's no doubt that it's a major issue. Um, I tend to work in the multinational space. So multinational companies, obviously, are more aware of this. They have their global policies and systems and support. Um, so I do a lot of work in that space. I think in the local community here, the more family-owned um, or Chinese, uh, mainly Chinese-owned, uh, there's a lot less focus on it. 
Um, but what I find very encouraging is that actually the younger generation here uh, totally understand it. Um, when they struggle with their mental health, they have the sense of hopelessness. What is the future for us? Will we ever be able to afford a flat because it's just so expensive here? Uh, what's the future for Hong Kong in, in greater China? Um, and so on. And then you know, some of that was behind the social unrest, actually. That was just the young people expressing their frustration and anxiety about the future. Um, so they, they get it, and there's a lot of activity at that, at that younger person level. Um, but their parents and grandparents, it's just much harder to engage them in discussions around mental health. Uh, it tends to be communicated about very obliquely. You know, I'm just feeling a little bit sad. So they wouldn't say they were depressed, they would just say, oh, yeah, feel a little bit sad or you know, something. So it's quite indirect, if you like. Um, so it's just a different way of, of working and communicating. Um, yeah, and and how how are um, workplaces then in in Hong Kong um, positioning this? Uh, are they, is it something that they're willing to invest time and resources into? Well, I think like everywhere, there's a spectrum. Um, you know, some people are very late to the party and still asking, "Can you come and do you know a mental health month talk uh, or something around men's mental health for November?" Um, Others at the other end of the spectrum, my, my law firm that I mentioned, Linklater's, they just won kind of like the top uh, tier status for City Mental Health Alliance's um, thriving at work um, analysis. So they came out top uh, and they have, they've had on site counselors for several years already. Uh, and the partners who are the most senior people in the firm, you know, they use that service and they talk to their people about the fact that they're going to see the counselor for a quick chat. Um, so they've really worked hard to normalize it. Um, uh, I understand that they are, you know, they do take into account people's workload and their mental health in terms of work allocation and so on. So, so I think it's a very wide spectrum from those that are really just starting out on the journey um, and those that have been quite thoughtful um, and really are starting. I would say not, you know, nobody's really totally addressed the systemic issues, but they're starting to acknowledge that there are some systemic things here. Um, and that we need to start to tackle them. Yeah, is there anything being done um, at a government level or at a more um, systems level um, with multiple organisations? Um, I mean, as I'm saying that, I'm thinking, well, yeah, with a lot of MNCs based in Hong Kong, like Singapore, probably isn't much local government push. It's more probably, like you say, from the global policies that it's happening. Uh, but is there anything locally happening besides outside of like the NGOs like City Mental Health Alliance? Well, I think, I mean, I notice a big difference between Singapore and Hong Kong. Um, <clears throat> Singapore, the government really has been you know, front and centre on mental health. Um, maybe their COVID experience, they had, as you probably know, quite a serious lockdown a couple of years ago. Um, I think that really brought a much stronger focus on everybody's mental health. Actually, their lockdown was more severe than we ever had here in Hong Kong. Yeah, um, and, and the they are, really, and they also trying to be a big ESG hub as well. Um, yeah, exactly. So, so they're they're much more on the front foot. They're right out there, even to the extent of providing funding. I think if you're a Singaporean-owned business, you can get eighty percent funding for a comprehensive program around mental health. Um, <clears throat> whereas here in Hong Kong, uh, you know, we just have different priorities. The government's been focused on the social unrest and the security law and they say they're focused on the housing, but nothing ever seems to happen. <laughs> you know, they just have a different set of priorities. And unfortunately, mental health is really not one of them. I mean, our previous chief executive used to sort of humble brag about the fact that she only got four hours sleep a night and never had time to talk to her husband. And, you know, it's, you know, it's really not good role modeling from the senior leadership around mental health here in Hong Kong, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, interesting. Mm. I don't think anybody should be bragging about only getting no. four hours of sleep a night. <laughs> no. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's not something I aspire to, that's for sure. Mm -mm. <laughs> no. Um, so let's have a, a bit of a chat about burnout and sort of how it's portrayed in news um, social media articles, um, that sort of thing. What are your thoughts about that? 
Yeah, well, I, that is, I find, more encouraging. Um, I mean, I've actually been blessed to feature in a couple of articles in the South China Morning Post, which is probably our leading English language newspaper here in Hong Kong. Um, just telling my story first time around, and then there was an American Chamber of Commerce panel where we had a, a focus on men's mental health. And so that was very well written up and published. Uh, and the SCMP has had a series of you know, um, articles on uh, burnout and mental health generally. So I think in, in the press um, and, and also on social media, there is actually a pretty good level of visibility, reasonable amount of awareness. We are starting to chip away at the stigma. Um, but I think what I also see is that burnout is still widely misunderstood. Oh, you know, I'm, I'm just feeling a bit burnt out this week, but Burnout is a chronic condition that takes months to build up and that lasts for months, if not years. It's not a mm. just you know, burned out this week. <laughs> so you might be feeling exhausted for sure. You might be feeling run down, but the chances are you're not actually burned out. Um, so just to recap what it is, I mean, burnout is a syndrome um, which is, uh, arises as a result of chronic workplace stress. I mean, it takes place over a long extended period of time that is not effectively managed, um, which is where I let myself down. I didn't manage it at all well. Uh, and it shows up in terms of low energy and exhaustion, uh, which I certainly experienced. It shows up in a sense of detachment, cynicism, negativity, kind of withdrawing, shutting down, which I also experienced, and also in reduced professional effectiveness. So you're just no longer able to do your job as well as you could before, which I definitely also experienced. So that's the definition of burnout. Um, as I say, I think it's not that well understood. So the articles that I see often are lacking a definition uh, of what actually they're, they're talking about. And sometimes the definition is not the one that's in the, the World Health Organization's book. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and often they uh, oversimplify and they just look at the emotional exhaustion element yeah. of, of it. Like you say, it's multifaceted, but they often just look at that tide, which is why you can understand why a lot of people go, oh, I'm feeling burnt out this week. If they just very much focus with exhaustion. On the so the articles that you see are often kind of lifestyle self-care oriented. Mm. So what can you do to fix yourself? Uh, many fewer articles on actually what are some of the systemic issues here? What is the organizational responsibility here? What's the role of the leader or the management in all of this? Very, very few um, articles in the mainstream press, maybe a bit more commentary in some parts of social media. Um, and the reality is that even though we have this awareness and visibility, people still not reaching out to get help, even if they know they're burned out. I've, I've had several friends who work in high pressure jobs in financial services, for example, and I know they really are burnt out, like officially. <laughs> and they will come up to me at social events and say, oh, Bronze is really burned out. And I ask them, well, so what are you doing about it? The answer is nothing. Nothing. They're just surviving, just getting through one day at a time. And, you know, even if I say to them that, you know, probably you ought to take that seriously and you really ought to get some help or come have a chat with me, have a one to one, let's just work through a few things. You know, it's still very hard to get people to engage. And, you know, I think that was part of my own experience. I mean, I went to the lunch and learn. I had learned all about symptoms of depression and anxiety, concluded that I had all of them, like 100% <laughs> full house, bingo, and still just went back to my desk and carried on. Um, didn't seek help until my physical symptoms got to such a point where I just had to go to the doctor to get a sleeping pill and to sort out my upset tummy. So yeah, so I think even with all the awareness and the visibility, you know, people still don't seek help for a whole host of reasons. And I think, I mean, burnout is sort of almost unique among, if we want to talk about, use, I guess, use the language of psychological disorder um, in that it is probably entirely a work-related phenomenon, whereas most other psychological disorders can be sort of personal life-related or work-related or a combination of both, whereas burnout is really predominantly... Um, as yeah, a result I mean, of the, work, that's yeah. The, that's the official definition. Um, I mean, in my personal experience, it was actually a combination of things, um, which for me started way back in about 2018. Um, so, 
you know, we had a, we had a big restructuring at work, so there was definitely a bunch of work-related stress. I was the chief operating officer. I was in charge of this big restructuring project, but it was a very long-term project, and we didn't know exactly, you know, how many people might lose their job, or when that might happen, or what the new reporting lines would be, or how the new services were meant to be delivered, and what was the role of the people in the local offices as opposed to the people in the service centres. So hugely. Um, you know, extreme ambiguity and uncertainty, really hard for everybody. Um, and in parallel with that, my, my wife got really chronic asthma and was hospitalized multiple times for extended periods. And that really changed her lifestyle. We're both very sporty. She could no longer do her sport. And then got, you know, she had her own mental health struggles um, adjusting to that new reality. And of course, all the tear gas that we had, that would have aggravated her. Um, her, you know, her, her asthma and then when COVID came along <clears throat> at that time I had a new boss who just started and someone I needed to build a relationship with because I hadn't he, he was in Jakarta and uh, came up to Hong Kong so I didn't know that well um, but then I was in this dilemma as to do I go to the office and spend time getting to know the new boss um, but if I do that then particularly I'm putting my wife's life at risk um, because of you know, chances of picking up COVID and then bringing it home so, you know, for me, it was that sort of confluence, almost a, almost a perfect storm of work-related and non-work-related events um, that just, you know, that, so I, as much I had you know, anxiety and depression as well, which are not necessarily within the definition of burnout, but for me, that all came together um, and it was, it was pretty hard. So, you know, as I said, I was, it was irritable, I felt tired, I was unfocused, I started withdrawing from social events, just not interested in going or just like turn up for a few minutes and then sneak off home. Um, I even, you know, because I was sleeping so little, I just could not get myself out of bed, which I normally get up at like 5.30 to go do my sport, just couldn't, couldn't do that. So even my sport started to go out the window. And I was just becoming, you know, cynical and withdrawn and losing interest in work and feeling overwhelmed, could never get to the bottom of the inbox, couldn't really prioritize, just seemed to be running from one meeting to the next without having an agenda, even if I was chairing the meeting. Um, and just feeling, you know, kind of fragile. I, I cried in the office once or twice. I had suicidal thoughts. Um, so it was really, you know, not pleasant. Um, and so my GP, my, my local doctor, when I went about the insomnia and the upset tummy, she said, okay, well, look, I can give you some medication for that and give you some more investigations, but, you know, do you think you'd benefit from seeing a psychiatrist? So, you know, again, that was one of those almost crying with relief moments when I said, yeah, you know what, honestly, I think that's exactly what I need. <laughs> so I was, I was lucky that she had the um, awareness to ask that question and to make it easy for me to say yes. Um, so then, you know, took some medication um, for the sleep and the depression. I had you know, talk therapy to help with all that negative thinking that I was falling into. Um, but even with all that, I, I did feel in the end like it was just not going to work, trying to keep working and trying to make myself better. So I stepped away in mid-2020. Um, I took up meditation and yoga, journaling. Uh, drawing actually is just a fun way of relaxing my mind and focusing on different um, sensory experiences, uh, reconnecting with friends, you know, chatting with family again. I mean, for a long time, I just let my wife talk to my mum and tried to avoid talking to my mum because I knew she would see that I was really struggling and I didn't want her to see me that way. So reconnecting with friends and family. Um, so lots of things that, that really helped over time, but it did take time. It took me probably 18 months, if I look back on it, to really feel my old self you know. and I knew I was back whenever one of my clients said because I've been talking to them about the story <laughs> and one of them said oh Brian yeah that was a pretty heavy subject but like you brought so much positive energy to it I thought oh great you know that's such a nice feedback to hear this you know, it's been a lot of hard work to get to that point but you know I finally felt that I was back to that, that level of positive energy and inner strength again so, you know, it's, it was tough and um, that's why I'm, I'm highly motivated by that because it was such a horrible experience. I really would not want to, you know, anybody else to go through that if we can possibly avoid it. So you know, that's why I do the work around educating individuals, but also working with employers so they can just be more aware of this, be more kind of attuned to the fact that this sort of thing can happen and that people will hide it and they will choose not to do anything about it unless you really 
encourage them and make it easy for them to say, actually, you know what, I do need a bit of help here. That's a, an amazing story, Brian. Um, and uh, I think it's something that our listeners need to hear about, you know, the effects that burnout can have. And, and I think when we oversimplify it and think about it just as being exhausted, right, rather than all the other things that you experience associated with it, you know, it's easy enough to fob it off and tell people to harden up or, you know, take a week off and uh, you'll come back and you'll be okay. Uh, but, you know, it obviously can be pretty despairing for the people experiencing it. So it's great to hear that. And um, thank you so much for, for sharing that. Uh, I wonder, Brian, if, um, you know, if you were to stay at work uh, and hadn't, you know, taken, made the decision to leave that environment that you could see was making you ill, um, you know, if, if it might have been a different outcome, do, do you think there would have been any way to work through it or with accommodations or reduced kind of work requirements? Do you think that you could have remained at work or did you really just need to completely do that well, disconnect I think, yeah, in I order to recover? Well, I think it too late. Uh, I think if I had done something earlier, hmm. uh, maybe we could have had a different outcome. Um, and people do, you do hear stories of people that have, you know, taken maybe quite a long period of time, uh, either completely off as a sort of leave of absence or <clears throat> on a much reduced workload, um, and then able to rebuild and get back to where they were after a period of time. Um, so I think that is, I think that is possible. Um, <clears throat> but that's very much a, that is very much a team sport. You know, you need support from your HR, you need support from your line manager, you need the framework of policy um, around providing whatever accommodations, um, you know, and behind that lies whatever kind of business case that the organization can see to, you know, allow for those accommodations. So sadly, unlike in Australia, where I know you have a new health and safety regulations that require people to have the kind of psychological safety uh, assessments and mitigation plans, sadly here in Hong Kong, we don't have that. Um, the best that we do is have uh, discrimination legislation, which says that if you have basically a long-term mental illness, that is a disability, and so you fall within the disability rules. It's not, it's not a health and safety thing, and it's not actually a corporate responsibility thing mm. either. Um, you know, so without that, it's it is it is a bit harder, I think, to get engaged with the leadership um, because unfortunately the costs of burnout they fall. At the moment, they fall very heavily on the individual, as in my case. Right? I lost my job, and I've been struggling to get back on my feet, and mm. you know, I'm probably imposing costs on the social support networks, and whatever medication and, and care and all that stuff. Um, you know, none of that cost is borne by the employer; they just carry on. Um, so, when the costs are hidden, and when the costs are actually carried by somebody else, you can understand why companies maybe don't focus on it as much as perhaps they should. So. You know, so that's where, you know. If anything, though, yeah, if anything, though, it's a word of warning, right? Like you say, if you'd um, been able to identify and, and get um, assistance earlier and there were accommodations that were available and you're aware of them and you were comfortable, like you had that psychological safety to be able to identify and have those conversations about getting those accommodations, yes. then maybe it wouldn't have been so severe, you know, and have that lasting impact. And I guess in the current war for talent where we're trying to, you know, attract and retain good quality staff, then uh, early intervention is key, right? Not allowing it to get to a point where you just have to completely yeah, absolutely. Leave the, yeah, the, 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 the all the research shows that you know, the younger generations, uh, all globally, um, you know, they do expect to be heard and listened to and taken seriously when they say they're struggling, and they do, you know, feel no sense of stigma mm. or shame or embarrassment about taking mental health days off or breaks or whatever they need to, you know, to work on that. So I think employers, they are increasingly um, paying attention to that because I think that's, that has now been widely publicised and people can see the level of turnover of their junior staff when they're struggling in the war for talent if they don't have a good story on mental health. Um, but you know, still the story they're telling is about we've got these benefits, we've got these apps, we've got these yoga and meditation sessions, et cetera, et cetera. So all of that is still fixing the individual. This is how we can support you because it's your problem. That's basically what all of that mm -hmm. is saying. <laughs> uh, so they're not doing the hard work of looking yeah. into what is it in terms of the resourcing versus the workload or the nature of the culture. 
um, or the level of support provided by managers. So those more systemic things which are like inherent in the way the business is run. Um, you don't see many employers going out saying, we thought about all this and we've got this great strategy for dealing with this and this is what it is. Um, you know, it focuses very much on here's how we can support you if you're struggling um, as an individual. That's where it stops. Yeah. Yeah, so that I guess that um, need for organisations to change to look at a that sort of preventative and proactive approach um, leads us into talking about um, influence at at the board level and actually getting the the board of directors um, engaged in this type of thinking and actually thinking about this as a business risk. Um, as a people risk, a reputational risk, you know, all of those different types of, of issues that we know that boards need to think about. Um, and if they're thinking about it, then there's more likelihood that the rest of the organisation will actually uh, sort of get into line and um, and do what needs to be done in that space. Do you have advice based on your experience in that sort of um, management um, type of a function, um, advice on how to get boards and executives to think more systemically or, or preventatively um, about yeah, mental well, health. Yeah, I mean, work. I have talked to non-exec directors and people on on board level roles um, about these issues, uh, and I think you know there are, there are a number of challenges, and there are some things that we can do about them. Uh, you know, I think some of the challenges are you know as fundamental as what is the role of the board. So, if the board sees its role as to maximise value for shareholders which is certainly a very North, North American perspective, um, then it's really hard because, as I mentioned a minute ago, the costs are not really necessarily carried by the organisation, or at least they're, they're kind of hidden. Um, and in other jurisdictions, um, you know, Australia, Europe, uh, you know, you have that broader ESG, uh, you have that broader stakeholders, the role of the board, the board sees themselves as being the custodians of all of the stakeholders in the company, not just the shareholders. So it's not just about maximizing profit, it is about doing the right thing for your customers and your uh, community and your employees and their families even. Uh, so that's the first thing is what, what is the kind of um, philosophical approach of the board is the first, is the first thing to tackle. Um, but even for the ones that are quite focused on the financials, you know, you can run the numbers so you know how many days of absenteeism you have and you can attribute a certain proportion of that, probably half or maybe a bit more to mental health of one sort or another, or mental health that affects physical health. So, you know, my upset tummy, I could have just reported that as an upset tummy, but of course, that's actually a mental health issue. So, um, you know, high proportion of absenteeism is, is mental health driven. Um, you have your staff turnover rate. Quite a high chunk of that will be due to the pressures and stresses of the workplace. And then you have that really invisible one, which is that presenteeism, that 35 days or the 50 days when people are just not able to function. Uh, and all of that has a cost. That, that last one is maybe 15 or 20 percent of your salary bill that you're paying for people to sit there just incapable of actually doing anything. Um, so those are big dollar numbers. So if it's about the dollar, there's big dollars at stake. You know, you can sit with the board, you can get your HR director and your finance director together. You put those numbers together in about 30 minutes, <laughs> uh, and that should get the attention of the board. Um, so yeah, that's that's one thing. But the reality is also that the boards typically don't have a lot of skill or experience around mental health. So they might have skills and experience around risk management or around financial management or around marketing and new product development, uh, business growth, uh, and so on. But typically, they don't have that many people that have really got deep experience and expertise in mental health, and they may or may not invite experts in to talk to them. Um, I think another challenge for boards is that the leadership is probably often part of the problem as well as part of the solution. And this is not having a dig at leaders. I think they are just caught in a very awkward position because they have their responsibilities to the board and to the shareholders to deliver on the KPIs and all of the business case and everything else. Um, <clears throat> and they probably do want to do the right thing by their people, but they may feel like I cannot sacrifice the revenue growth or, or whatever because you know, I'll lose my job if I do that. <laughs> um, so how do the boards work with the management to set 
you know, additional KPIs that are entirely empathetic, are they being, uh, or high compassion, are they being, um, or even, you know, around mental health measures, there's lots of ways of, as you know, measuring mental health. So have we got um, executives being KPI'd and bonused based on those measures? Um, you know, so that's a, some of my board level friends are having that conversation at board level and they're saying in their remuneration committee it's actually you know we do need to start putting a focus on these sort of additional alternative kpis if we really want to move the needle um on corporate mental health so you know so it's it's difficult it's it supports lack information they lack experience they have this complicated dynamic within which they have to operate um but it starts by getting it on the agenda using that quantitative and maybe some qualitative input and then discussing with the board, like, what are the moral obligations here? What, what obligation do we have not to break people <laughs> and not to externalize all these costs on society of unhealthy coping mechanisms, like people going home and just drinking too much or getting into fights because they're being aggressive or, you know, or, or imposing costs on the healthcare system through all of those factors, whether that's the direct mental health or whether it's the physical manifestations of, of stress that show up in physical um, illness. And then, as you mentioned, there are all the reputational and sustainability issues. So you know, there's been a few high profile organizations where we just had a chronically high suicide rate, very, very sadly. And in, in France, in particular, I spent some time living in France. There was one company where actually some of the executives went to jail because they were just seem to be, you know, in breach of their moral and legal duties of care to the people that they were employing. Um, and then what sort of culture? So boards are custodians of culture. I think that's kind of taken as read in most cases. So what is the culture that we're trying to create? Um, and you know, there's different ways of looking at that. I mean, one way is, this, is that risk and safety perspective. Um, but of course, the other way of that, the glass half full way of looking at that, if I can put it that way, is how do we create a culture where people can thrive? Like work can be extremely good for your mental health. It gives you a sense of purpose. It gives you connections and social connections with your colleagues. It helps you to learn and grow um, as a person. You know, all of those things that can be a source of support, you know, all of those things can be hugely positive. So why don't we flip it around and say, okay, well, what would it take? What would it take to create an environment like that? And if we were able to create an environment like that, what would that give us? Uh, you can immediately see our people will be so much more engaged, they'll be so much more productive, they'll be able to collaborate and be creative try new stuff out without being worried about whether you know, they're going to get beaten up for making a mistake and so on and so on. So, you know, I think it's just, it's just about getting the right language and the right way of communicating and the right information in front of the board and really just engaging in a conversation with them. You know, and I think a lot of this stuff, although there's lots, all sorts of technical aspects to it, a lot of it is just intuitively easy to understand you know, if you present it in the right way. So. What you do about it is harder because it takes time, but you know, we've got to start with that conversation. Yeah, so it's about really understanding what is the board going to be concerned about as your first step and then um, pulling together your data in a way to tell a compelling story about those, um, those things that the board are concerned about. Yeah, great. Um, so when talking about, I guess, people and culture strategy, uh, mental health is a topic that comes up a lot, uh, but one that probably comes up just as much, if not more, is diversity, equity and inclusion, or DEI. Um, so what are the, the benefits, first of all, Brian, uh, for a company about having um, a more inclusive yeah, culture? Yeah, I love this question. Uh, um I may not have mentioned in passing, but I'm, yeah, I'm on the, I did mention I'm on the board of the Women's Foundation. So I've done a lot of work in diversity, equity, inclusion space. Um, and now you hear people talking about DEIB, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Um, so why are they doing that? Uh, I mean, I think, for, first of all, people are realizing that diversity of itself is not enough. So if you have a diverse team, actually, that just makes it harder because there's all sorts of opportunities for misunderstanding and you know, lack of trust and so on. So that's why you need inclusion. And I think beyond inclusion, even belonging goes a bit deeper. Um, so if you're included, you feel like, yeah, okay, I have a voice here. Um, if you have belonging, you feel I have a voice and actually my voice is welcomed and appreciated. And people just take me as they see me and take me for what I'm able to bring. 
and I feel safe in that environment. Um, so creating that sense of belonging is super important. So for any minority group like the LGBTQ community or any sort of ethnic minority, any ability type minority, maybe even ageism um, kind of minority groups, you know, they all suffer disproportionate mental health challenges. And for me, that the heart of that is that sense of lack of safety. I am not safe in this environment. There is a threat to me because I'm a person of color or because I'm you know, gay or lesbian or whatever. Um, and so you're always compensating, you're always kind of looking over your shoulder, you're always trying to hide that in some way maybe, or you're trying desperately hard to fit in, which just takes a lot of emotional effort. Um, so all of those things will leave you feeling emotionally exhausted at some point. Um, uh, so that's why I think belonging is, is so important. And that's why I think, you know, to my mind, mental health and inclusion and belonging all fit together. They're all part of the same package of that culture in which people can thrive. Um, and of course, the research shows, I mentioned Amy Edmondson at the start, and um, she's done a lot of work around psychological safety, leading academic in that space. Um, and also, of course, Google had their project Aristotle, uh, which is now nearly 10 years ago or maybe more. They researched into what is it that makes a high performing team and they found that it's not actually just diversity although maybe diversity is one of the factors but it actually it is about having a psychological safety in that team so those diverse individuals can you know feel comfortable together and you know learn together so yeah so i do feel that the diversity part is super important and i mentioned earlier that you know this stuff is a team sport it's a social thing um so we ran a program recently which was exactly around this. So how do we tap into our feelings of inclusion or exclusion and our feelings of, am I safe here or not safe? Um, if I'm feeling there's some sense of other in this person because they're somewhat different, what, what are my feelings? Where, where are my feelings of otherness for this person coming from? <laughs> so it's really a mindful ex exploration of bias and you know, discomfort of dealing with people who are different from you. Um, so really going deeply into what am I believing? What stories am I t telling myself um, about people like them? Um, and how is that getting in the way of our ability to really connect with each other and to connect deeply in a way that's going to allow us to really thrive and work together? Um, so it really is a skill. It's a skill and it's a practice. It's not a theory. It's not a best practice in that sense. It's not a policy. Um, so again, this is not so much about DE and I today because we could talk a whole other session about that. But you know, again, I think there's there's a lot of focus on uh, policy in that space, um, but actually, you know, inclusion of belonging is a skill that needs to be integrated, and it, and it is increasingly being integrated into leadership and management development. Um, and we're now trying to take it to that really deep sort of introspective level where people get that gut feel, that visceral understanding of actually what are we really talking about here. Mm -hmm. um, and I mentioned about my, my career, like. Uh, Feeling that feeling of being excluded or a feeling of struggling in some way is so painful. Everybody can tap into that and feel it. Um, and then we try and work with that to encourage people to, you know, ensure that others don't have that experience and really try to be more inclusive. Yeah, it's uh, it's like a lot of things, I think, in the human resource domain where it gets managed through policies, right, rather than actual skill building. Um, or thinking about things systemically and thinking about higher order or more upstream ways of, of dealing with these these issues. And we can see definitely, if not done correctly, psychological health and safety could be kind of confined to living in policy land uh, and you know just throwing a bunch of administrative controls at psychosocial hazards to manage them. Um, but I guess this is, you know, a, a show about psychological health and safety rather than DEI. and i um, So what parallels or links would you make uh, between DE&I and yeah, psychological well, and health so and safety? I think safety? that, you know, this, it is all about how safe do I feel. So, you know, if you go all the way back to your <laughs> the infamous saber tooth tiger, the fight and flight response, um, you know, that's kind of evolved into us all. Uh, you know, that does get triggered in the workplace when you feel a sense of threat to your identity, and in particular where you feel a sense of social threat, i.e. do I belong here or do I not? 
because if I don't belong in this social group, I'm kind of cast out in the wilderness and it's just me and a saber-toothed tiger. It's not me and my tribe versus a saber-toothed tiger. <laughs> you know, so that's, that's an extremely scary place to be and that's going to create a huge amount of stress and anxiety. Um, so that's, that's kind of, if you like, that's the biology um, behind this. Um, so if, if you do have people that are left feeling, I really don't know if I'm in this tribe or if I'm not, um, because I'm in some way being pushed out, I'm being, I'm being outcast, I'm being othered in some way, uh, for sure that is going to result in mental health issues. So that is, that's the psychosocial risk right there, is that if you make people feel like they do not belong, um, this, you know, their psychosocial, their psychological health is definitely going to be at risk for sure. Yeah, so that's the, that's sort of a micro connection between the two. Yeah. Uh, and Joel and I have spoken about this before about, yeah, you know, if um, you're not managing DE and I well, then it can be a psychosocial hazard if it's causing the people to become stressed because, you know, they're feeling excluded or, yeah. you know, they feel uncomfortable within um, the social context of work. Experiencing biases and all of these additional struggles um, yeah. they have to deal with, you know, that's having an effect. Yeah, this is a really interesting topic for me and I sort of think about like this tension between acculturation within an organisation and sort of understanding the behavioural norms and how can, how far can you sort of stretch those those norms, um, how much masking do you have to do um, and how much effort and energy does that take um, and how much of your soul do you have to give up? Um, if I want to use that kind of a language. Um, it's It's a really... It's sort of a bit of a, a, a tightrope, you know. Um, I think even for people who are coming from like the the the, the same, essentially, you know, if you're all if you're all heterosexual and you're all white and you're all you know whatever fitting into that sort of majority um, classification, you're still bringing those those individual differences. And how much of that do you actually? I know you alluded to that before. How much of yourself do you bring to work? Um, and how much of yourself do you do you mask? Um, and so, yeah, for people who are outside of that um, that normative or that that norm group, I guess that tension becomes a lot more significant for them as well. And how how can organisations approach That's that? Right. I mean, it happens, you know, obviously within organisations as well. So, um, you know, engineering versus uh, marketing or HR versus finance or everybody versus IT. <laughs> so you have all these silos um, <laughs> and each silo is its own tribe in a way. Um, and if you're not in that tribe, everybody else is an other, not to be fully trusted or to be treated with a lot of, you know, arm's length kind of <laughs> distancing. Um, so yeah, so th that's what happens. It's yeah, smaller companies, it's easier. Everybody can know each other, and everybody's the same tribe. But as you get bigger, um, you, you get this happening even you know within the silos and subcultures in in any organisation. So it's it's at play absolutely in every in every company, whatever their DEI policy. So it's nothing to do with um, you know, sexual orientation or gender or racial background or anything else. It's just as what sort of job do you do? Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's it's hard. I mean, there's a lot of research that shows that you know, the standard sort of traditional unconscious bias training maybe doesn't help. In fact, maybe people feel like they've got a get out of jail free card. It's just wow, bias. It's just I can't help it. So like, whatever. <laughs> so yeah, so I think it is hard. And, and what I'm what we are trying to do, and uh, with, you know, some of my um, business partners, is to really help people to like turn the spotlight inwards in the sense that we can understand ourselves better and actually the only thing that we can change is ourselves. So, um, you know, we can't change necessarily the organization, we can't change the culture overnight, but if we can introspect a little bit, be a little more self-aware of, you know, when am I not fully hearing? When am I not fully understanding? When am I experiencing discomfort? When am I starting to turn away from that discomfort rather than turn towards it and try to figure out where is it coming from? And what would it take for me to get a bit more comfortable with it? Um, uh, was that discomfort getting in the way of my ability to achieve the kind of relational outcomes and workplace outcomes that I want to see? Uh, so I think it's only by you know, going inwards and being much more mindful um, about 
you know, all of that baggage that we all carry um, and how that's affecting our interactions with other people. Um, that is, you know, that's really hard work. It's going to take a long, old time you know, to do. Um, but then again, I think everybody knows there are no easy answers. If there were easy answers to subjects with social risk and mental health and diversity inclusion, <laughs> we would have we would have solved it a long time ago. Um, but the reality is, it's super complicated, and it comes from kind of inside it, inside all of us. Um, so for me, I'm a much of my mindfulness practice. Uh, I do a lot of meditation, and, and I find that. Uh, that kind of contemplative practice, um, and particularly when you're doing it in a group or with another person, so you can actually share experiences, uh, really helps to generate insights that do help open up this whole space of how do we create greater inclusion, greater belonging, greater sense of you know, thriving, um, greater sense of safety. So thinking about, I guess, the idea of actually facilitating a sense of belonging, I've sort of this has just popped into my head, so please tell me if I'm wildly off, off track here. Are there parallels with things like when we talk about, um, you know, reasonable accommodations? Mm -hmm. is, is there elements of that within sort of yeah, facilitating absolutely. belonging absolutely. for people. So, you know, if you are willing to work with somebody to understand what it is that they need, what, what accommodations are going to be helpful for this particular individual, given their circumstances and whatever it is that they're struggling with. If you came to me and said, Brad, I really want to you know, understand better, what would be helpful for you? And you're willing to help me with those accommodations. You know, I'm going to feel I'm going to feel seen and heard. So thank you for listening. Thank you for asking. I really appreciate this opportunity to share because it has been on my mind. I'm like, I don't feel good about the fact that I'm struggling here. But what I'm hearing from you is that you want to understand and that you want to support me and that you value me for what I bring. And that the fact that I'm going through a bit of a rough patch is not the end of our relationship. You know, quite the contrary, you're willing to work with me through that difficult period to come out in a better place for both of us. So that absolutely is going to make me feel like I'm valued and I belong here. Yeah. And then I guess there's the extra complexity then of how does that mm -hmm. communicate out to the rest yeah, of the exactly. team? So, you know, that's why I mentioned I do a lot of work around how do you have these kind of compassionate conversations and Catherine Mannick's book um, on that is a great example. And Brian, Brian also expands and has a similar framework for how do you have these kind of connected and compassionate conversations with people. Um, so I think it is, you know, it's a skill set that takes practice, um, you know, but it is within everybody's ability to do this stuff. We are social beings and we can tune into our own feelings and we can be empathetic and tune into other people's feelings. Um, I think the majority of people, <laughs> one or two particular types of mental health condition may be um, you know, we instinctively want to make the world better for other people. We are naturally compassionate. Um, you know, so it's just creating the opportunity for people to really focus on those skills, to cultivate them, to practice them, to feel safe while they're doing that, um, to feel like those sort of behaviours are actually rewarded, um, to be allowed time to do that as well. It doesn't need a lot of time. You know, in a fairly short conversation, we can have a check in, we can find out how each other are doing, we can find support and connection and that all goes to that sense of belonging. So you know, the I'm too busy or it takes too long is not the real reason. The real reason is because we don't like to sit with that discomfort and we don't like to do that introspection. Uh, it's a little bit scary to go through that process. So yeah, so I think that's, that's you know, there's no easy answer, it's just gonna take time, but it is more than possible, absolutely. Just, set that intention, set that direction, and get some support from the board and the senior executives, you know, have them show up to whatever kind of belonging type practices or mindfulness type practices like this, um, have them role model that, have them you know, show that they're actually capable of really managing their own emotional state, really able to listen deeply to people um, and hear them and respond to what it is that they're hearing. So a lot of, a lot of work, but you know, it's not the it's not going to be fixed overnight, that's for sure. Yeah, and a lot of work that's um, almost counterculture to corporate um, corporate culture, I guess, up until yeah. maybe the last few years. Yeah, so. I think if, if your focus is on financials um, and 
How much of that do you yeah, think will, will age yeah, out? I, I, I ask myself that question all the time. You know, will this change in my working lifetime? It's just not that many more years, probably. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I think it has to. I think it has to change because of that war for talent, uh, because of all the research and because of all the business case and because of the ESG agenda and because of the health and safety at work type legislation, regulatory pressures. You know, all of those are nudging in the right direction. Um, very hard to predict, you know, how fast it will eventually move. But maybe we just reach a tipping point and suddenly people get it and they really start focusing on this. You know, or it may take us a little bit longer. It's very really hard to know. Like gender equality and inclusion, we've been chipping away for a hundred years and so seem to be going backwards. LGBT rights in most countries, we did reach a tipping point. Even like I come from Ireland, um, you know, they reached a tipping point uh, just a few years ago and voted for gay marriage and all the rest. So, you know, so it is possible that we can get to that point, um, but it's pretty hard to predict you know, whether we will actually get there. I think all we can do is like people like you, people like me, people like the audience on this program, you know, we just got to do what we can do, talk about this, raise these issues, try and normalize the conversation, um, try and do some role modeling and that's how we bring change. Which is um, probably a good segue, Brian, into a question that we like to ask all of our listeners towards the end of our chats. Um, so if you were to look into the future, what would your hopes of, for the future of workplace mental yeah, health I love be? that question. I think it's a few things. One would be I, I hope that more countries will bring in regulations like you know, health and safety at work ones because uh, I do think that's what it's going to take. I think there's too many other systemic um, factors that I mentioned before, pushing boards and executives in, in a different direction and need this to be brought into focus more clearly. Um, I really do hope that boards will integrate mental health and wellbeing into the S, the social part of their ESG strategy. It's just, it's just part of that moral uh, and legal and reputational responsibility that they have. Uh, I would hope that more leaders will actually open up to seek help for themselves and to talk about it openly. Um, if I was still in my work, like full-time workplace role, would I be sharing my story as openly as I did today? I don't think so. <laughs> Very few leaders feel safe enough to do that. It goes back to that psychological safety, even for the most senior people in organisations. And as I mentioned, I think having, you know, I really hope that we do get to KPIs that include some of these you know, softer skills, which are actually the really hard ones. So measure sort of empathy or compassion uh, and ultimately moving the focus from fixing the people to all of this understanding of the systemic and cultural uh, factors that go into creating workplaces where people can thrive. Yep. <laughs> Ambitious. Ambitious. Always uh, happy. <laughs> we'd, we'd like to, we'd, yes. we'd like to see it happen in our lifetime though. Yes. So, yeah. So last question for you today, Brian, words of advice for listeners who want to work in the psychological yeah, well, safety the space. Yeah, uh, there's so much to do. Um, just um, and thank you for doing this work. I know it's, it's often hard. It's not, often not really recognized or valued or appreciated or rewarded, uh, but it is so important. So yeah, so thank you for doing this work and yeah, keep going. Great. Well, Brian, it's um, been a fascinating conversation. Um, probably the best description of a lived experience of burnout that we've heard. Mm -hmm. We've heard other people talk, um, like Georgie Tamer, talk really great about um, our burnout uh, conceptually. Yeah. Um, we've had people like Christine Jung talk about um, belonging and, uh, and loneliness. Um, uh, but that, that was a really powerful story. So I'm really hoping our listeners got a lot out of that and hopefully we'll share this episode with people who really need to understand this is the impact, the negative impact we can have on our people if we don't actually think about this and, and give it the, uh, the respect that it deserves. So, um, yeah, thanks for coming on and sharing. And, and Brian, I'm, I'm, um, I'm, I'm thinking our listeners probably want to know how can they connect with you or find yeah, out well, more about you and your work. Words. I do really appreciate that. I mean, I, I have told the story many times. It's always cathartic. It's never easy. I was almost tearing up there earlier <laughs> at one point. So, yeah, thank you for the appreciation. <laughs> um, yeah, so Brian at wholebusinesswellness.com or you can find me on LinkedIn uh, where I post fairly regularly. So, yeah, always happy to connect, always happy to have a conversation and uh, explore all of these issues. 
Great, and we'll uh, put that in uh, show notes, the, the link to your, uh, your your website at least, and then uh, people will be able to track you down. But yeah, Brian, thanks again. Um, can't under, underestimate how grateful we are for you to come on and, and share that story. Overestimate. Overestimate? Underestimate? Yeah. We can't overestimate. It's Friday. If you couldn't underestimate, that Joel, would be it's Friday afternoon. insulting. It's, I'm tired. I'm be not, I'm, more articulate. Oh, look, I'm not perfect. I'm the first to put my hand up and admit that. So That's true. That is true, listeners. I cannot overestimate or overstate um, how great that was. Thank so, you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Brian. Um, thank thanks, you so Brian. much, and uh, we'll, we'll keep in touch. Um, but, listeners, that brings us to the end of this excellent episode that I can't overestimate. Um, you can remember, if you if you like, <laughs> if you prefer to watch these videos, not that Brian moved a lot, but um, you can check out the video uh, on, <laughs> on the Flourish Tech's YouTube channel. Uh, we also take snippets of this, uh, these these clips with our guests, which well, there will definitely be a few that uh, Joel can choose from today, um, that we'll put up on our Flourish DX LinkedIn page. Uh, while you're over on LinkedIn, Brian's obviously over there, as as Joel and myself, so feel free to uh, c- continue the conversation via that channel. Uh, but that's it. We'll catch you next episode. You've been listening to the Psych Health and Safety Podcast. To stay up to date with the latest on psychological injury prevention, follow Flourish DX on LinkedIn and subscribe to the Psych Health and Safety Podcast at www.psychhealthandsafety.com.